Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the POPSIP webinar titled Enzymatic Approach for the Production of Healthy Functional Oils. I am Melvin, a committee at POPSIP. Before we begin, I would like to remind that everyone online will be muted throughout the event by default, as a known to avoid any interference to the presentation. If at any time you are experiencing difficulties in hearing the webinar, please first ensure you have a stable internet connection. If any time, if you are still unable to hear, please type in the chat box or click raise your hand button and our team will assist you so shortly. If you have any questions about the presented materials, please lodge your questions into the Q&A box. All responses will be given by the presenter after the presentation. First of all, I would like to introduce to you about POPSIC. POPSIC is a not-for-profit special interest group under the umbrella of UK-based Institution of Chemical Engineers, ICMP. We focus on the chemical engineering practices in the, oil pump, in the palm oil industry. We provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, the sharing of experiences and encouraging innovation in the palm oil processing industry but our membership is not restricted to the chemical engineering. Our major activities are webinar, forum, university rock show, as well as delivering newsletters, awards, and bursaries to the students. If you miss some of our live events, you can always view the summary on our newsletter webpage. Our upcoming webinars will be on Monday, 26 June, it will be presented by Professor Naomi Shibasaki Kitakawa, Professor at Tohoku University, Japan, and Chief Technology Officer at Phytochemical Products uh, Incorporated, Japan. Her presentation title is Process for Simultaneous Production of Functional Ingredients and Biofuels from Unused Resources in Palm Oil Refinery. All our webinars are free of charge and open to all. Lastly, we would like to thank to our sponsors in 2023, Tesmet Malaysia, KLK Oleomas, Malaysian Palm Oil Council and POC, and Malaysian Oil Chemical Fund Manufacturers Group, MOMG, and for their support to POPSIC upcoming activities in 2023. Before we move on to the presentation, I would like to introduce you to the speaker, Dr. Pua Entong. Dr. Pua is a lecturer at University Technology, Brunei, uh, he, has be, he has a keen interest in investigating the structural modification of macromolecules such as carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. His primary approach is through the use of enzymatic and chemical methods to alter and enhance their physical, chemical, and nutritional properties. Now I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Pa for his presentation. Please, Dr. Pa. Thank you, Melvin. So before I start the presentation, let me share the slide first. So can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So I can I will start the presentation now. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining the webinar today. So my name is Dr. Paul Intong. I'm, I'm and I am very delighted to be the speaker for today's session. So the presentation uh, today uh, is enzymatic approach for the production of the healthy functional oil. And also in this topic, we will go, we are going to explore the potential applications of enzymes in fats and oils industry. So this is an outline of the presentation today, which consists of the importance of fats and oils, the limitations and the possible strategy, functional fats and oils, chemical methods for the modification, enzymatic modif uh, methods for the modification, and lastly, the challenges uh, faced by the industry. So we all know that the palm oil is a very important commodity in the world. It contributes to almost 35 to 40% of the global vegetable oil markets. 
So palm oil is very crucial in our daily life because we know that uh, we have to consume a lot of the palm oil. It can be used for a lot of this, what we call the food applications. So palm oil is very important because it is a concentrated source of energy for the body. So it can provide a very high energy value for various physical activities. Besides that, we know that the palm oil consists of both balanced saturated and also unsaturated fatty acids. This is very important in order for us to have a healthy life, uh, in order for us to have a, a, a good health. So other than that, we all know that the palm oil can be used in a wide range of foods, like for example, pastries, margarine, shortening, cocoa butter substitute, cooking oil, and also as a trunk. So other than that, we all know that the palm oil consists of a lot of vitamins and also some of the other bioactive compounds as well. Like for example, tocopherols, trocotrienols, and also etc. So lastly, the palm oil is very useful also not only in the food applications, it also can be utilized in other applications as well. Like for example, cosmetic, pharmaceuticals, and also the chemical industry. So that's why the palm oil is very important. However, when we are talking about the palm oil, the problem associated with the palm oil and also with other types of the edible fats and oil is that it has a very limited application in the native states. Also, some of the saturated, some of the vegetables oil, they are very high in saturated fatty acid or unsaturated fatty but uh, unsaturated fatty acid, which will reduce the potential applications or the nutritional properties. So in addition, some of the specific physical chemical properties and also the functional properties is not shown in a particular types of the vegetables oil. Like for example, when we are thinking about the palm oil, we all know that the palm oil, even though it's very high in saturated fatty acid, but to certain extent is liquid in nature. Okay, of course, it contains some of the solid fats as well, but due to the, uh, because of the unsaturation of the fatty acid and also uh, because the palm oil is very liquid in nature, so the applications of the palm oil actually is quite limited. So most of the time, the palm oil can only be used as a cooking oil. So if we want to extend the applications of the palm oil, so we have to do something about it. Like for example, if let's say we want to produce the bitter, uh, the peanut butter, so we need to make sure that the oil that we are using to produce the peanut butter must be in the solid form. Or if let's say we want to produce a margarine, we want to produce uh, this what we call the, the cake, the pastry, we have to make sure that this what we call the shortening and also as a trap, we have to make sure that the palm oil that we use is semi-solid in nature. So, if let's say we want to extend the applications of the palm oil, all we can do is we can do some of the modifications. We can have some of the modification strategies. Like for example, we can have done some of the we can have done the hydrogenation. We can have the physical approach like uh, blending and fractionation. And also lastly, we can use the chemical approach as well. So the chemical approach will be like the interesterification. So these are some of the modification strategies that have been employed to produce the fats and oils with specific functional physical chemical and also the nutritional properties. And also the most commonly used methods is the hydrogenation, which involves the addition of the hydrogen molecules onto the unsaturated bonding of the fatty acids to produce the saturated fatty acids. And then the end product has a very solid and also the rigid structure that can be used as a hard stop for various fruit products such as the margarine and also the sharp shortening. So other types of the modifications will be like uh, what I mentioned just now, blending, fractionation, and also the interesterification. Uh, But the problem with the physical approach, such as the blending and also the fractionation, uh, even though it's a very promising approach, but it has some of the disadvantages. Like for example, when we are thinking about the blending, there might be a possibility of oil incompatible between the oils and also the fats. 
And then we call this as the non-eutetic system. And also, even though we have done some of the blending and also the fractionation, it, we will still have the limited, uh, limited functional properties as well. Okay. Of course, we know that the blending and fractionation, they are quite cheap. And also, it can probably enhance the physical chemical properties, such as the smoke point, heat stability, and also so on. And also, the ease operation basically is quite simple. Basically, we just have to do the blending. Uh, together, we just have to blend the oils together. Or um, if let's say we are thinking about the fractionation, basically we just have to control the temperature to induce the crystallization. Now after that, we just have to do the filtration. We will be able to get the uh, the, the types of the beds that we want. And also, of course, it can enhance the nutritional profiles as well. Okay, but still the same thing when we are thinking about the physical approach there might be a possibility of incompatible between the oils and also the bats. And also, we will still uh, have the issue of limited functional properties. So before we further discuss about the enzymatic approach, so the first thing is that, okay, if we want to extend the applications of the fats and oils, right, we need to produce something like, uh, we need to tailor the, the structures of the, we need to tailor the structures of the lipid molecules. So that is, uh, it can be applied for a specific food applications. And here comes the structure lipids. So the structure lipids can be modified and altered to produce a lipid with specific chemical structures. Like for example, we want to have a, a fatty acid profile, which uh, we want to have a unsaturated fatty acid profile. So we can tailor the lipid structures and incorporate more unsaturated fatty acid into the triacyl gas role. Or maybe we can, change it. Uh, we can change the length of the fatty acid, we can increase the unsaturation, or we can increase the saturation of the fats, and also we can play around with the positional distribution of the fatty acid, acid as well. So other than that, the structural uh, lipids, basically we can play around with the uh, molecular architectures, like the crystal, the crystal shape, the size, polymorphic forms, crystalline networks, and also we can uh, do something about this, what we call the molecular structures of the lipids. Other than that, actually, we can uh, change the physical, uh, physical chemical properties of the lipids as well. Like for example, the crystallization behavior, the melting behavior, uh, so the, the rheological properties, and also the solid fat content. And lastly, the health aspect we can change the nutritional value of the lipids as well, okay? So that uh, we can uh, modify this, what we call the lipid digestion, uh, when we uh, ingest this, what we call the lipids in our body, when we ingest the lipids. So uh, we can change this, what we call the lipid digestion system in our body. So this is why it's very important for us to have the structural lipid, okay? Which cannot be, um, which cannot be produced by just simply using the blending or this what we call the fractionation. We have to do, we have to do something about it uh, from a chemical and also the enzymatic perspective. So when we are talking about structural lipids, we have different types of the structural lipids depending on the end usage. Like for example, the first one, the low calorie fats. So the ca low calorie fats, uh, sorry, the low calorie oils and fats basically has a very short chain fatty acid as SN1 and SN2 position as what you can see from the figures here. So the short chain fatty acid has a very low calorie due to its low carbon chain length. So also due to the high digestibility, the fats and oils can be digested very easily and it will be able to give a appetite satisfying effects. So some of the commercial available low calorie fats include the salatrim and also the crabinin. So these are some of the potential low calorie fats that we can tailor, that we can modify. So this is one of the examples of the structural lipid. So other than this, actually we can uh, structure, we can modify the lipids to become, uh, we can modify and alter the structure of the lipid to make the oil become easily absorbable. So what we can do about it is that we can uh, change it into a medium long chain tri-alcyl Okay, 
So if we have the uh, medium long chain triacyl glycerol, the MLCT, so as well you can see from the figures here is that the MLCT has a medium chain fatty acid as SN1 and SN3 position, making it very easily to be digested and the resulting outside glycerol can be absorbed very easily. So if let's say we put the functional fatty acids that we want, like for example, DHA, EPA at the SN2 position, it will become much easier to be absorbed by our body. So this will be one of the strategy if we want to deliver a specific functional fatty acid uh, in our body. So we can make it into a medium long chain triazole glycerol, or sometimes we call it as the MLCT. So other than this, actually, we can modify the lipids to make it become like the medium chain triazide glycerols as well. So this is what we call the MCT. This MCT, because of the presence of the medium chain fatty acid, it can be digested very easily. And also it will be able to provide an instant energy to the body as well. That's why MCT oil is one of the very popular and famous oil uh, in the world as well. So we have the MCT being produced by some of the countries like, uh, as far well I remember is from the Japan, okay? That produce quite a lot of this, what we call the MCT oil. So other than the easily absorbable oil, thirdly, we can have the LCT oils as well, the long chain triazole glycerol. So this is an oil that is hardly digested in the body. So it means that, when we ingest this, what we call the long chain triazole glycerol, LCT, it will not be digested or absorbed by our body. So this will be one of the strategy to reduce the obesity. So in digestible oil actually is another strategy that we can, uh, we can uh, reduce the obesity. So we can play around with the structures of the uh, molecules of the, we can play around with the molecular structures of the lipid to make the oil not digestible. So other than that, we have the diazole glycerol oils as well. A diazole glycerol oil is a very special oil because it does not have any fatty acid at SN2 position. It only has the hydroxyl group. So due to the absence of the fatty acid as the, at the SN2 position, so it will show a different metabolism pathway. So it cannot be resynthesized to form the triazide glycerol in the body by the intestinal epithelial cell. So this kind of oil actually is very useful if we want to manage our weight without sacrificing the sensory properties of the food. Because we know that nowadays there are many different types of uh, uh, fat replacer, like for example, the protein-based uh, fat replacer, the carbohydrate-based uh, fat replacer that can be used to replace the, the, the conventional oil. But the problem if let's say we are using the protein-based uh, fat replacer or the carbohydrate-based fat replacer, it will sacrifice the sensory properties of food. So this is not desired. So that's why diazole glycerol oil will become something that is very special, that is very useful if we want to control the weight. And at the same time, we do not want to sacrifice the sensory properties of the food. So other than the diazole glycerol oil, we have the milk fat substitutes as well. So milk fat substitute is very special because it has the palmitic acid at the SN2 position so that it can be easily absorbed in the infants. Okay, so one of the very, uh, one of the commercial milk fat substitute is what we call the betapole. Okay, so it will have the palmitic acid as a, at the SN2 position and also it will have another two fatty acid at the SN1 and also the SN2 position. So other than the milk fat substitute, lastly, we can produce something like specialty fats for the chocolates as well. So we know that if we are talking about the chocolates, most of the time we need to use the cocoa butter to produce the chocolate. So we know that when we are talking about the cocoa butter, it has, it mainly consists of the triazole guys raw of POP, POS, and also SOS. 
So P just means the power metric acid, O is the oleic acid, P is the power metric acid. So these are the three types of the triacid glycerol, which make out of the cocoa butter. So if that is the case, if let's say uh, we want to produce the cocoa butter, actually we can tailor or alter or modify the structures of the oils as well. So other than that, actually we have another special effects for the chocolates as well. This is uh, the bad, uh, this is the anti blooming agent for the chocolate. Okay, special effect for the chocolate as well. Okay. So just now we have talked about the physical approach, like the blending and also the fractionation. I told you guys that, okay, blending and fraction basically is one of the very useful way of modifying the, uh, of extending the applications of fats and oil. But the problem is that even though we have done the fractionations and also the blending, the applications of fats and oil somehow is still limited. So, if we want to uh, extend the applications of the vegetables oil, we need to produce the structural lipid. So the structural lipid will be the one that we mentioned just now. Okay, but of course, there are many different types of the structural lipids as well. So to produce these structural lipids, chemical methods can be used. Like for example, we can use the hydrogenation. We can use the interesterification. However, when we are talking about the chemical methods to produce the structural lipid, it requires a very high temperature, high pressure, and also we require the presence of the chemical catalyst as well. So the results of these chemical approaches are deterioration of the oil quality. Like for example, because we are using a very high temperature and high pressure, it will cause the destruction of the unsaturated bonding. It will cause the formation of the peroxides, aldehydes, and also the also the ketones, which makes the oil become rancid. So this is not desired. So other than that, when we are talking about chemical approach, it will have a low specificity. So that means that there will be a very high oil losses with a low amount of the desired products being uh, being formed because the process, I mean the chemical reactions, is not specific. So we will produce different types of the uh, what we call the lipid structures. So it's not specific enough. If let's say you recall back what we have, um, what we have, uh, what I have discussed just now is that, like for example, I want to produce the milk fat substitute. We need to make sure that the palm oil, uh, sorry, the palmitic acid is at the SN2 position. So because interesterification uh, is not specific enough. So most probably we are not able to produce the product with the desired properties. So this is something that is not uh, useful as well. So that's why chemical methods is not, uh, is not desired. Other than that, there might be a possibility of producing the trans fat, okay, which is a very serious issue nowadays. Like for example, I want to use the hydrogenation to produce the saturated fats. So most probably we will be able to produce the trans fat. So this is something that we need to avoid because the trans fat is somehow associated with the cardiovascular diseases and also other complications. So that's why we need to use the high temperature, uh, high pressure, and also the presence of the chemical at the least uh, during the chemical approaches I keep when we are using the chemical methods. So most of the time we need to have the additional purification steps, which is the refining process. Okay, we need to have an additional refining process in order for us to purify the fats. So we know that the chemical approaches, uh, it has some of the disadvantages as what we mentioned just now, high temperature, high pressure, presence of the chemical catalyst. So that's why there's a lot of uh, this, what we call the formation of the undesired products like ketones, aldehyde, trans fats, low specificity, and also it requires an, an additional refining process. So to overcome this issue, enzymatic methods, on the other hand, are more preferable. The reason is that enzymatic methods is highly specific so that we are able to produce a very high priority product, shorter reaction time. That means that we can have a faster reaction rate due to a much lower activation energy. And also we can carry out the process at a much lower temperature 
and also at ambient pressure. And most importantly, enzymatic methods is considered as one of the environmentally friendly methods. Because it has low energy consumption, we do not require a very high temperature. So that's why it can lower the carbon footprint. But the problem with the enzymatic methods is that in, uh, the, the enzyme cost is very high. Okay, what kind of enzymatic reactions of fats and oils that we can have? Basically, if let's say we want to tailor the molecular structures of the lipids, uh, we can have different types of the reactions. Okay, so if we want to tailor or modify the chemical structures of the food next time in the future, we need to make sure that we are using the suitable methods. So that's why right now we are going to talk about different types of the enzymatic uh, reactions of fats and oils. So the first one is the hydrolysis. So the hydrolysis basically is the removal of the fatty acid from the fat triacylglycerol with the presence of the water. So if we want to control the hydrolysis, we want to optimize the hydrolysis reaction, we need to make sure that the amount of the water added is optimal. The operating time is optimal. So we need to make sure that there is a presence of solvents and also the emulsifier because we know that the triacyl guys raw or we call it as the oil and also the water, they are not miscible with each other. And also we need to make sure that the types of the, the, types, of the types of the enzymes that we use um, is correct, is appropriate. Like we have different types of the enzymes like one tree specific or non-specific enzymes. So hydrolysis is one of the reactions that we can have. Other than this, we can have the esterifications as well. So the esterification is the esterifying of the fatty acids onto the glycerol backbone with simultaneous removal of the water. So the successful of this, what we call the esterification, it depends on the rate of water removal using the vacuum or the silica gel or and also the operating time so the we need to optimize the operating times as well so we need to make sure that there is a uh, there is a presence of the solvent and also the carrier and also the types of the enzymes still play a very important role in optimizing the process the types of the enzymes and also the concentration of the enzymes so other than the esterification we have the glycerolysis as well so the glycerolysis is the exchanging of the fatty acids between the glycerol and also the triazide glycerol. So the successfulness of this what we call the glycerolysis, it depends on the amount of the water, okay, operating time, presence of the solvents or the carrier, and also the types of the enzymes. So the glycerolysis is somehow similar to that of the is somehow similar to that of the alcoholysis. Just that alcoholysis, we are using the alcohol as the SR acceptors. So we can have the interesterifications as well, which is the exchanging of the fatty acid between the triazyl glycerol A and also the triazyl glycerol B, as well you can see over here. So we can have A in one of the triazyl glycerol and then we have B in another triazyl glycerol. So during the esterification, there will be an exchange between the fatty acids between the triazyl guys rule. So this is another enzymatic reactions that we can have. This is another, this is another reactions that we can have. Now after that, we have the alcoholysis and also the acidolysis. So alcoholysis, we are using the alcohol as the acyl acceptors. And also for acidolysis, we are using the fatty acid as the acyl reactors, uh, acyl, acyl, sorry, acyl acceptors. So these are the different types of the enzymatic reactions that we can have, okay, in order for us to do the modifications uh, to alter the molecular structures of the lipids. So we have discussed a lot, like we have to talk about the physical approach, the enzymatic approach, and also uh, we have talked about different types of the enzymatic approach, like interesterifications. Um, we have talked about the acidolysis, glycerolysis, acidifications, and also uh, this what we call uh, esterification, interesterification, and also so forth, and also other types of uh, reactions. And also we have talked about different types of structural lipids. So you have, you might ask me, 
Okay, we know that the enzymatic is, methods is very useful to, to tailor the fats and also the oil structure. So the question is right now is that, could palm oil be used as a feedstock to produce the structural lipids or the functional fats and oils? Or could we use the enzymatic way to extend the applications of the palm oil? The answer is definitely yes. As what you can see over here, like for example, we want to produce the cocoa butter equivalent. We can use the palm meat fraction and also we can have the fatty acids such as the palm fatty acid distillate containing the steric acid, palmitic acid, myristic acid, or we can use the steric acid as the free fatty acid. We can carry out this what we call the acidolysis. When we carry out this kind of acidolysis, probably we will be able to produce the uh, cocoa butter equivalent. Because we know that the palm meat fractions is high in POP, palmitic acid, oleic acid, palmitic acid. But we know that the structure, I mean the composition of the cocoa butter should consist of POP, POS, and also SOS. So using the palm meat fraction alone may not be able to produce the suitable of the suitable functional properties or physical, physical chemical properties of the, uh, of the lipids that you want. So if let's say we want to extend the physical chemical properties of the uh, palm oil, we can carry out the acidolysis. Okay, we can use the enzyme because the enzyme is very specific. If we can use the enzyme to alter the position uh, to, to cleave this what we call the one tree position of the fatty acid and then incorporate another fatty acid uh, at the one tree position. By doing that, we will be able to produce the POP, POS and also the SOS. And then the resulting products will be more rep, can be more representing this what we call the cocoa butter. So this is one of the way to tailor. Uh, this is one, this is one of the, I mean this the palm oil can be add as a feedstock to produce the cocoa butter equivalent. Other than that, actually we can do some other this what we call the esterifications as well. Sorry, we are we can do this what we call the uh, uh, what we call that. We can do this what we call the interesterification. So as well you can see over here, we have the palm oil as the feedstock. Then we can have the hydrogenated soybean as the another feedstock. So we just we have to re-add the palm oil and also the hydrogenated soybean soybean oil, or we can re-add the palm oil with the tristerine. Probably we will be able to produce the POS, POP, and also the SOS as well. So this is another way that we can produce the cocoa powder equivalent. Other than this, the palm oil can be also used to produce the diacylglycerol oil. Like for example, these are some of the references that you can refer. And then they are using different types of the reaction. Uh, they are using different enzymatic reactions to produce the diacylglycerol oil. Like for example, palm oil based diacylglycerol oil, palm kernel based, uh, palm kernel oil based diacylglycerol oil, palm sterine diacylglycerol, uh, palm uh, palm oil in diacylglycerol, and also etc. And also we can also use the palm based substrate to produce the milk fat substitutes as well. Like for example, we can use the palm sterine and also the oily acid. Or we can use the soybean oil, palm kernel sterine, palm sterine, oleic acid, and linoleic acid to do the interesterification. Then we will be able to produce the milk fat analog as well. So other than that, we can use the palm oil as a feed store to produce the MLCT. And also we can use the palm-based substrate to produce the MCTs as well. Okay, because when we are talking about the palm oil, basically it consists a lot of the palmitic acid, oleic acid, and also this work called the steric acid. Other than that, when we are talking about the palm kernel oil, it consists a lot of this work called the medium chain fatty acid, which makes it very suitable as a feedstock to produce uh, different types of the functional oil, to produce different types of the structural lipids. So that's why we can always opt for the enzymatic approach in order for us to produce the lipids or fats and oils that we want with the desired physical, proper, physical chemical properties and also the functional properties. 
So, however, the challenges with the enzymatic approach is that high enzyme costs, and also there might be a possibility of low amount of the desired products, and perhaps the requirement of the solvents and also the emulsifier to facilitate the reaction, such as the geyserosis and also the hydrolysis, which we know that the geyserol and also this what we call the triacyl geyserol, they are not miscible with each other like hydrolysis, the water and also the oil, they are not miscible with each other. So this is the challenges that we have to overcome. So one of the strategy to overcome the enzyme cost is to immobilize the enzyme debase by using different techniques, such as the absorption, cross-linking, encapsulation, entrapment, and, entrapment, and also as a drug so that the enzymes can be recycled or reused for many times. On top of that, we can also genetically modify the lipase that can withstand the extreme operating condition. Okay, like for example, high temperature, high pH, we can uh, use the lipase that can withstand with high temperature or pH. And also we can modify the lipase to make sure that the lipase has a very high specificity towards a specific substrate. Like, as what we know is that for some of the lipase that have a very high specificity towards the short chain fatty acid, some of the lipase that have a very high specificity towards the long chain fatty acid. So we can always, uh, we can always uh, change the types of the lipase uh, that is suitable for that particular types of the fatty acids. Also, we can play around with the types of the reactors or the configurations. Like for example, one of the very useful techniques that we can use is the pet bed reactor system. We can use the dual bed system or more. And also the types of the arrangement will have an effect on the reaction efficiency as well. We can use the series and also we can use the parallel arrangement. And also the most important things about this pet bed reactor system is that we can separate the enzyme bed with ease. That means that we can, if let's say the, the enzymes has already deteriorated, we can change the enzyme bed very easily. And we can reduce the pressure drop. And also it has a very high reactance to enzyme ratio if we are using the pet bed reactor system. So other than that, actually, we can opt for other types of the reactors to enhance the mass and also the heat transfers as well, such as the barber column reactors. And also we can use different types of the system like the macroporous monolith. Okay, it will have a reduced pressure drop. So these are some of the methods that we can play around if let's say we want to reuse the enzymes so that we will be able to overcome the high enzyme cost. And at the same time, we will be able to enhance the operation efficiencies as well, so that the reaction will be much faster. We will have a reduced pressure drop, and also the heat and mass transfer will be much faster, and also as a drop. Then, in terms of the product quality, okay, so if we want to produce the products that we want, okay, using the palm oil as the feedstock we can always use different types of enzyme. Okay, we can always use one tree specific or non-specific enzymes or fatty acid specific enzyme lipase, uh, enzyme lipase to do the modification to have the enzymatic reactions. So we know that one tree specific lipase will cut the fatty acid bond at one tree position. Non-specific lipase will cut the fatty acid at SN1, SN2, and also as entry position. So we can always play around with the types of the lipase in order for us to produce the types of the, um, the types of the structure lipid that we want. Like for example, uh, I'm talking about the milk fat substitute. We know that when we are talking about the palm oil, okay, most of the time the SN2 position is, more, is mainly dominated by unsaturated uh, fatty acid, like oleic acid like uh, this what we call the oily, like oily acid. So if we, are, we want to use the palm oil to produce the milk fat substitute, it will be very difficult because we know that the palmitic acid has to be at the SN2 position. So in order for us to achieve 
uh, to produce the mu fat substitute or mu fat analog, all we need to do is that we can use the non-specific lipase first. So to change the position of the fatty acid as SN2 position, we just have to incorporate more palmitic acid to the SN2 position. Then after that, only we use the one tree specific uh, lipase to incorporate the DHA, the EPA into the uh, lipids so that the milk fat analog that we produce will be high in EPA, DHA, and also will be very easily absorbed in the baby, in, uh, by the baby. Okay, so these are some of the techniques that we can play around and uh, we call it as the dual or uh, multiple enzyme system. Okay, we are playing around with the types of the enzymes that we use because different types of enzymes, we have different types of specificity. So we can play around with that. So other than this, another disadvantages of using the enzymatic approach is that somehow we need to use the solvents because some of the substrates they are not miscible with each other. Like for example, water and oil, guys, and oil, they are not miscible with each other. So in order for us to solve that, we can always apply a more advanced technology. Like for example, we can use the ionic liquid. Okay, the ionic liquid is less volatile, less flammable, low toxicity, and it has a unit solubility for organic and inorganic materials. Other than this, we can use the ultrasound emulsification. So that we will be able to increase the total surface area for the lipase activity so that the reaction will be much faster. We can also use other types of technology like microwave technology because the energy transfer is much shorter. We can also use the cold plasma technology to promote the cleavage of the ester bonding and a very low temperature condition. And also we can use the pulse electrical field as well. All this technology basically can be combined together with the enzymatic approach, which until now is, new, is still not well discovered or explored. So this is a new direction for the lipid scientists to play around in the future, to incorporate all this advanced technology, uh, to incorporate the uh, advanced technology in the, enzymatic, uh, in the enzymatic reaction in order for us to enhance the efficiency to produce the structural lipids that we want. So in summary, I will say, Palm oil basically has a very vast potential to serve as a raw materials for the functional oil production. It can be used to produce the Daosa gastro oil. It can be used to produce the MCT oil. It can be used to produce the MLCT oil. And also milk fat uh, analog. It can also use to produce the cocoa butter subsidy, uh, equivalent. So we, all we need to do is that we just have to play around with the techniques that we have currently or try to incorporate some of the advanced technology together uh, with this, what we call the enzymatic approach in order for us to produce the, the, the structural lipids that we want. So, and also enzymatic catalysis basically is, very, is preferable from a environmental cause and also the efficiency perspective. But we need to overcome some of the challenges. Uh, we need to overcome some of the challenges. So one of the challenges with the enzymatic catalysis is the possibility of the use of the solvents. We may need to use the solvents to uh, facilitate the reactions. Or maybe we need to use, uh, because the enzyme cost is very high, so we need to, uh, we need to reuse the enzyme so that we will be able to uh, reduce what we call the operational cost. So these are some of the challenges that uh, we need to overcome. So yeah, so that's all from uh, this all from that's all from my presentation. So I hope you enjoy the presentation today. So any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Dr. Prof, for the very informative information. It's interesting to know uh, the different type of oil and fats that we are consuming daily and how they can be produced. We invite questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box and Dr. Paul will clear your doubt. So at this time, we have actually received a few questions. Probably the first questions to Dr. Paul. 
any enzyme available to reduce the AG in oil? Yeah, actually, whatever types of enzymes can be used to reduce the DAG in oil. Because as what I know is that DAG actually is one of the precursor for the formation of 3-MCPD. So sometimes, right, if let's say we want to reduce the 3-MCPD, one of the strategies that we can play around is to reduce the DAG in oil. So if let's say we want to reduce the DAG in oil, all we need to do is that we just have to convert the DAG back into the TAG. So all we need to do is that we just have to incorporate the fatty acids and we just have to put in the enzyme and convert back the DAG back to TAG. So this will be one of the strategy that we can use to reduce the DAG. Thanks, Dr. Poir, for the clear answer. For the second question, is it possible to produce MCT from raw coconut oil using enzymatic process? Yes, it's possible. Actually, actually, we can play around. Actually, we can uh, produce the MCT uh, from the coconut oil by using the enzyme lipase. Yeah, we can do that. And then our third question, how do you compare the tendency of trans fats generation via enzymatic approach, physical and chemical approaches? Is it better than fractionation? Okay, how do you compare the tendency of trans fat generation via enzymatic approach against physical and chemical approaches? Is it better than the fractionation? Um, I would say if let's say we are talking about the chemical approach, like the hydrogenations and, or, and also the hydrogenation or the interesterification, there is a very high tendency uh, there is a very high tendency of producing the trans fat, very high tendency. So it's preferable to use the physical method. Okay, if we are only comparing the physical methods and also the chemical methods. Okay, we are not talking about the enzyme approach. So, go on, yeah. So if let's say we are just comparing the physical and also the chemical methods, basically physical methods is more appropriate. Uh, it's more, it, it's preferable if let's say we want to reduce the trans fat formation. Thanks, Dr. Pua. And then here comes our next question. Enzymes are already in use in some vegetable oil refining. However, mm -hmm. its uses in palm oil is very limited. What would be the new usage and which healthy functional oils can be produced using enzymes? Yeah, enzyme can be produced, uh, sorry, enzyme are already used in the vegetable oil refining process. Like for example, we can use the protease, we can use the cyanase to enhance the, this one called the extraction yield. And also we can use the enzymes like the phospholipase to remove the phospholipids in the oils as well. So this is commonly used in the palm oil industry. Uh, palm oil refining uh, industry. But if let's say we want to extend the applications of the palm oil, actually we can use the, uh, the enzymes to produce the structural lipid as what I mentioned earlier, like uh, diazagastrol oil, MCT oil, milk fat and a lot, and also different types of the structural lipids. So these are the, some, these are the functional oil that we, are, uh, that we are interested in. Thanks, Dr. Poa. Can you elaborate more about the non eutectic nature of palm oil TAGS? Uh, non eutectic nature of the palm oil TAG means that, like for example, if I want to do the blending, I want to uh, incorporate the uh, palm oil together with the coconut oil. But bear in mind that palm oil consists mainly of palmitic acid, oleic acid, and also the steric acid. But coconut oil, the uh, they consist mainly of the medium chain fatty acid. So when we incorporate these two oils together, they might have this what we call the eutectic, uh, non eutectic nature. That means that some of the fatty acid will have a much higher melting and crystallization uh, point. Some and then the other TAG will have a different uh, melting and also the crystallization point. So they are not compatible with, compatible with each other. So this is what we call the non eutectic effects. Thanks, Dr. Poor. So we, 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 yeah. No, no, you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So we prefer to produce a structural lipids which is more consistent, like POS, SOS, POP. So this is a more uh, similar in terms of the chemical structures. 
like if we are talking about coconut oil, because the coconut oil mainly consists of medium chain. So we will have the medium chain triazide as well. And also when we are talking about the palm oil, it consists mainly of a long chain fatty acid. So if let's say we just blend these two to oil together, basically they are not miscible with each other. I, it's miscible, just that they are not compatible with each other. One of it will have a very uh, low melting point. And then the other one, we have a very high melting point. So eventually we will have two distinct, this is what we call the melting profile. So which is not appropriate. So this is what we call the eudetic effects. I see. Thanks, Dr. For for the very clear explanation. Next, we actually have two questions related to biodiesel. Can you use enzyme to produce biodiesel? That means the methyl ester. Yeah, definitely. We can use the uh, biodiesel to, uh, we can use the enzyme to produce the biodiesel. And then the next question, how do you control the hydrogenation and interestification to avoid it to be completely convert to biodiesel? To avoid it to be converted, okay, how do we convert? Okay. Uh, as what I know is that hydrogenation and also interesterification, if we do not have the alcohol, it cannot be converted into the methyl ester because we need to have the met methanol or ethanol in order for us to produce uh, the methyl, methyl ester. So if let's say we are just doing this, what we call the conventional hydrogenation or interesterification without using any alcohol, like um, met methanol and also the ethanol, there's no, there's no possible, I, I mean, the possibility of producing the methyl ester actually is very low. Thanks, Dr. Pua. Then when do we use solvent in the enzyme interestification? When we use, uh, when we use the solvent in enzyme interestification. For interesterification, normally the solvent may not be required. But if let's say we are talking about hydrolysis, esterification, then the solvent may be required because both the glycerol and also the oil, actually they are not miscible with each other. Okay, okay. One is very hydrophobic and then the other one is very hydrophilic. For interesterification wise, because we are talking about a vegetable, a vegetable oil A and also vegetable oil B. So basically they are miscible with each other. So we have no need to use the solvent to increase uh, we have no need to use the solvent in this case because the, basically they are already miscible with each other. So no point for us to use the solvent anymore. Thanks, Dr. Pua, to answer all the questions. To conclude the webinar, may I invite Dr. Pua to convey a short closing remarks to our audience tonight? Okay. So, okay, I would say is that Enzymatic approach is a very useful method to produce the structured lipids that we have. And also we know that the palm oil is very useful, but to a certain extent, the palm oil cannot be used for different types of the applications because of the, uh, because of the chemical structures of the, of the palm oil. So some of the common ways that is employed in the industry is that the physical methods like the blending and also the fractionation. So these are two ways to extend the applications of the palm oil. So that's why we have different types of the uh, palm oil fractions like uh, palm sterine, palm olein, palm super olein, uh, palm meat fraction, and also uh, different types of the fractions. But using all these fractions alone may not be able to extend further the applications of the palm oil. So that's why enzymatic approach is a very useful method. Okay, compared to the chemical methods, of course, chemical methods can be used and also is widely used in the industry until now. But the problem with the chemical approach like the hydrogenation and also the interestification, basically, uh, it requires a very high temperature and also the high pressure. So we will produce, at the end of the, of the reactions, we will produce quite a lot of the undesired products, such as the trans fat, uh, ketones, aldehydes, uh, it will mix the, uh, this one called the fats and oil to become rancid. So we will need to have an additional purification steps at the end, so which is not appropriate. So if let's say we want to produce a very specific 
uh, this what we call the structural lipid with the desired functional properties or physical chemical properties, enzymatic will play a very important role. And also the other things is that, okay, when we are thinking about enzymatic approach, uh, it has some of the drawbacks, like for example, uh, enzyme calls, uh, there might be a possibility of uh, the needs of the solvents and also as a child. But we can always uh, use advanced technology and also we can use uh, the specific types of the lipase to enhance the efficiency, or maybe we can use the types of the reactors to overcome all this issue. So basically, yeah, this will be the enzymatic approach uh, for the production of the functional lipids. So I believe um, enzymatics uh, is a very useful method and also, yeah. So that's all from my side. Thank you, Dr. Pua, for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to ICAMI members and the general public. And thank you, everyone, for supporting at, uh, for your support in making this webinar a success. Uh, we look forward to your participation at our upcoming webinar by Professor at Hohoku University, Japan, and the Chief Technology Officer of Vital Chemical Products. There's a link in the chat box that you may register your participation in our next webinar. Then this comes to the end of our session for tonight. Have a good day and a good rest. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.